This is probably one of the most famous equations ever put to paper. After enjoying over 350 years of mystique, Andrew Wiles proved the equation does not have solutions in the non-zero integers, if n is at least 3. But what would happen if we modified the ground on which it stands? For instance, rather than asking about the non-zero integers, we could think about what happens if we allow them to cycle modulo a prime number. Would Fermat's conjecture stand its ground, or could we break it? Mathematician Isai Shur considered this as a possible proof tactic when he was trying to prove Fermat's original conjecture, and in 1916 published a wonderful proof showing that the theorem in fact fails modulo primes. More precisely that given any n, the equation will have non-trivial solutions for all but finitely many primes p. Basically, allow the cycle to be large enough and you'll get solutions. To do this, he used an incredibly ingenious fusion of graph colorings and basic group theory. And in this video, I'm going to show you how he did it. We start with the graph theory. A complete graph is simply what you get by taking vertices and joining all pairs of points. If it has n vertices, we say it has order n and is labeled kn. So k3 would be a triangle, k4 would be this object, and so on. A special case of a famous result in graph theory, Ramsey's theorem, says the following. If you choose a certain number of colors, then there will always be a complete graph kn, which, no matter how you color its edges using those colors, will result in a monochromatic triangle somewhere, meaning a triangle where all three edges have the same color. Of course, this implies colorings of complete graphs larger than this one will also inevitably contain monochromatic triangles. Given some number of colors, the threshold beyond which that is true is called a Ramsey number, and finding them is a notoriously difficult problem. With two colors, this threshold is six. This is because you can color K5 without monochromatic triangles, but a simple counting argument will show that any attempt at K6 will inevitably contain one. With three colors, things get a fair bit harder. The minimal graph size is now 17. Indeed, another counting argument will reveal that monochromatic triangles will always appear in order 17 or more, if you only use three colors. But on the other hand, there is a clever method for coloring K16 with three colors without monochromatic triangles. But even at merely four colors, the exact value is unknown. Currently, we know that it is somewhere between 51 and 62. Luckily for our proof, we don't need the exact threshold, just that one exists, and that is fundamentally what Ramsey's theorem provides. Shor then proved the following theorem. For any fixed number of colors, it is always possible to select a large enough integer n such that, whenever we color the integers between 1 and n, there will always be three of the same color such that two of them sum to the third. Shor ingeniously proved this using Ramsey's theorem. Suppose for instance we are interested in three colors. Ramsey says that there is some value n, in this case 17, such that any complete graph of order at least n contains a monochromatic triangle. We pick any number at least as large, I'll take 21. Let's also create 21 vertices. Now we randomly color the list of numbers on the right using the three colors. We'll use this to color the complete graph k21, but in a very specific way. First, label the vertices from 1 to 21. Now, for any two of them, we could compute their positive difference, which we can view as the number of vertices to cross to get from the smaller one to the larger one anti-clockwise. This will be a number between 1 and 21, which has been assigned a color on the right-hand side. So, simply use that color on the edge joining those two vertices. In other words, for the edge AB, use the color of B minus A. Let's do this methodically in our example. First, look at all pairs whose difference is 1, and use blue edges for all of them. Next, look at all pairs whose difference is 2, and use red edges for all of those. And then blue edges for 3, and so on. This process eventually creates a coloring of the complete graph. Now, because the size of this graph is greater than or equal to the threshold, Ramsey guarantees a monochromatic triangle. The nice thing about a triangle is that the steps between both of the shorter edges add up to those for the longer edge. Because they correspond to three of the same color on the right, we get exactly what we were looking for. More generally, if we say the monochromatic triangle joins A, B, C in increasing order, then this tells us their positive differences B minus A, C minus B, 
and C minus A are of one color. And because the first two sum to the third, well, with some swift relabeling, we get an X, a Y, and a Z of one color, with X plus Y equals Z. We now get closer to Fermat by venturing through some group theory. Let's focus solely on the numbers between 1 and P minus 1 modulo P, where P is any prime number. Rather than write A congruent to be mod P in this way, I'll use the following abbreviation to avoid cluttering the screen. We'll need two basic facts. The first is that for every element A between 1 and P minus 1, there is always a multiplicative inverse element, meaning the product of both is equal to 1. Consequently, if we can factorize both sides by some value C, we are allowed to cancel it out by multiplying both sides by its inverse. The other fact we'll need is that in every such group, there will always be something called a primitive root, which is some number where, if raised to successive powers and kept mod P, will generate all the numbers between 1 and p minus 1. In other words, every number in the group is equal to that primitive root elevated to some power. In general, it's not always easy to find primitive roots, but group theory informs us that they always exist modulo a prime. Armed with all of this information, we arrive at Shor's conclusion. To break from us conjecture for kth powers in modular arithmetic, we'll choose k colors, and select any prime number that is larger than the Ramsey threshold for k colors and monochromatic triangles. Now take the integers between 1 and p minus 1, and find a primitive root u. Write every element as a power of u. Now comes the killer move. Let's cleverly choose to rewrite the powers themselves as k, our chosen number of colors, times a quotient, plus a remainder r basically just Euclidean division by k. Those remainders are integers between 0 and k minus 1. In other words, they can take k possible values. So we could try something interesting, such as associate each possible remainder with one of our colors, and then color the integers according to what that remainder is. For instance, a remainder of 3 would correspond to the fourth color, here yellow, so we color this first element in yellow. Perhaps the next power has a remainder of 1, so we look up the relevant color and use it on that element. And we simply carry on in this manner, eventually coloring all the elements, which were just the numbers between 1 and p minus 1. Now, Shor's theorem says that there must be an a, b, c in this set, which are of the same color, and a plus b equals c. Or equivalently, we can express this in terms of our primitive root, modulo p. Because of our coloring method, all the exponents have the same remainder r, allowing us to factor out u to the r, which from before, we can cancel using its inverse, leaving us with this. You can probably see where this is going. We have three elements here, which are kth powers, and if we take the roots along with their quotients and simply relabel them, well, we get x to the k plus y to the k congruent to z to the k modulo p. Fermat has failed modulo a prime. I'll do an example with k being 3. For three colors, the relevant Ramsey threshold is 17, so we need to select a prime larger, say 23. 23 has many primitive roots, I'll choose a largish one like 19 for fun. We then express all numbers from 1 to 22 as powers of 19 modulo 23. Next, perform Euclidean division by 3 on all of those powers. Now, to color, let's say remainders of 0 are blue, remainders of 1 are red, and remainders of 2 are yellow. Shor's result said that somewhere in here, we'll have 3 of the same color, 2 of which sum to the other. For instance, 2, 8, and 10. Converting these back to powers of 19 modulo 23, we get this expression here. In other words, a sum of cubes congruent to another cube. You could simplify this, but I like how scary it looks as is. And that's how you break from a modulo a prime. I hope you enjoyed this video, which is based on the paper Uber de Congruence x to the m plus y to the m congruent to z to the m mod p, written by Isai Shore. If you're interested in more of this sort of content, do subscribe.